Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of the monthly Internet Governance uh, Briefing. Um, we will cover the developments from April, and we'll look into May. For those of you that are new to uh, our monthly webinars, don't forget that it's every um, last Tuesday of the month. Uh, and uh, here is how it works. We will start with looking into what happened in April particularly quick list of events, um, then what we call the barometer, where the pressure of the digital developments is high. Um, then we look into some of the trends that we select every month. It's not easy, I can tell you, but, uh, but we welcome your comments. At the end, we'll look into the, um, what's coming out of the events in, uh, in May. And finally, we will hear from uh, regional updates from around the world. Uh, in the meantime, we'll certainly Welcome all of your questions and comments to the chat. Uh, with me, uh, I have uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Marco, who is helping the online moderation. He'll try to sum up the discussions in the chat, so feel free to discuss and raise questions. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Teresa, Arvin, Jovan, and Andriana, who are helping with uh, or will jumping, jump in on some of the issues. Serena, uh, Katerina, uh, Fire, and many others who are helping in the background. There's a huge team of people helping with the webinar. Uh, moving straight to the developments, the main developments that we had uh, in April. You can uh, notice, and I'm sure you noticed in your own uh, field of work, that a lot of events have been uh, cancelled or postponed, almost as if uh, when we are traveling around the world and you have all these unfortunate uh, cancellations and delays of the flights. Uh, so, for instance, we had the Global Privacy Summit uh, which uh, which was cancelled, uh, the WSIS forum, which, which was postponed, IGF Russia postponed, um, Internet Freedom Festival was cancelled, World Intellectual Property uh, moved to online format, uh, and then uh, uh, there are some others. It's interesting to look at the two particular ones. One is the e-commerce week, which is the main e-commerce event uh, globally, which was basically... Um, in a way, cancelled at the beginning, but then it was turned into the e-week as a, as a sort of a sequence of online events, uh, which we are, by the way, reporting from on the Digital Watch platform, so you can <clears throat> reflect on what's happening there. The other one is uh, is the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise um, <laughs> celebration of the fifth anniversary, which was then called uh, GFC Five. It was scheduled to be to take place in the Hague in April. But then it simply uh, went into a series of online events instead. Uh, and, uh, and now it's happening over a number of days. So it shows that uh, the, the, the online format of the events is probably not always as we envisage the in situ one. But we'll get back to that in one of the trends very soon. Uh, okay, moving on to what are to the barometer, basically, the main developments uh, in, uh, in April. And we start with the global, uh, global architecture and what are the main developments uh, in, in the field of global I, I, IG architectures. We are selecting just a few. All of them you can basically list and read more on the Digital Watch Observatory. Uh, the ITU and the Office of the UN Under Secretary General, Fabrizio Hochschild, uh, launched a series of digital cooperation in response to COVID-19. Uh, pandemics and the discussions uh, will address issues such as internet safety, stability, affordability, uh, inclusivity. Uh, they will also focus on identifying solutions for addressing related challenges. So it's basically one of the follow-ups uh, of the <clears throat> work of the high-level panel on digital cooperation and on the recommendations that were provided by, uh, by the, uh, the, the, the panel. Uh, moving on to sustainable development, uh, maybe what we can outline um, is uh, the annual report uh, of the uh, uh, Beyond Uncertainty, which highlights that digitalization has the power to transform the global economy, something that we know, but now formally underlined, but that developing and emerging countries still struggle to enact policies that will enable them to, to reap these benefits uh, of the transformation. And as such, they require the assistance from the uh, international community. And at the same time, we have the IT uh, frontier technologies to protect the environment and tackle climate change, uh, which is exploring the role of emerging uh, 
technologies such as 5G, AI, IoT, big data in combating climate change, improving water management, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and managing natural disasters. So basically a clear link to the sustainable development goals. Uh, moving on to security. Uh, in field of security, of course, there's always, uh, there is a number of uh, attacks, accusations. We are, again, not going to, to focus much on that. At the moment, you can find more on the uh, digital watch, uh, cybersecurity uh, basket, basically. But there are two interesting uh, bits to underline here. <clears throat> Building on the uh, UN Secretary call for immediate global ceasefire of armed conflict, we have seen the UN Under Secretary Hotchild, who called for an immediate global uh, digital ceasefire during during the nineteen pandemics. It, it basically links to um, reports that COVID nineteen has been used. Uh, by both the criminals and uh, non-state and state-linked uh, actors uh, in conducting attacks, including against the hospitals, against the uh, schools and, and so on. There's a, there was a lot of phishing campaigns <laughs> and we reported on that uh, or we discussed that during one of the webinars of Diplot two weeks ago. You can look at the summary. Uh, basically, uh, US Under Secretary General said, we must commit to an immediate digital ceasefire and governments and the private sector uh, must uh, set the tone uh, uh, step, uh, um, um, our global response to the pandemic will be weakened. At the same time, we have seen UNICEF and its partners uh, warned of increasing child vulnerability during the pandemics uh, as they spend more time online and are more exposed to online um, tools, but including uh, the risks from sexual exploitation, cyber bullying, and so on, and the and UNICEF basically released a new technical note urging governments, technology companies, parents, and educators uh, to take a uh, necessary uh, step in 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 this uh, in this regard. Uh, moving on to e-commerce, and there we have the biggest uh, update based on Libra. So I pass the floor to our my colleague Arvin to maybe cover more on Libra. Arvin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vlada. Uh, hope you can hear me all, all well, of course. Uh, Libra actually was um, again in the spotlight last month. Uh, during the, uh, uh, during the, uh, they actually, what they did is uh, they rewrite the uh, white paper. So Libra is now a completely new proposal. Uh, what they actually do it and why they do it. This was, uh, this was of course, only uh, due to the regulatory pressure and uh, they wanted to comply with uh, FinCEN and other financial institutions uh, uh, requirements for the stable coins. So Libra was now redesigned not to issue a single stable coin, single global stable coin, but will actually issue many stable coins, which will be related to a certain specific uh, fiat currency of, uh, of a specific country. For example, uh, Libra will issue Libra uh, US dollar, Libra Euro, uh, Libra Swiss franc, etc. So what this basically means that uh, uh, Libra will not be the scrutiny of the Financial Stability Board and other major institutions from the financial world, but actually will uh, will actually comply will actually comply with all uh, all of this uh, all of this uh, regulatory framework, which was uh, designed by um, by economic regulators. Another another change in. Uh, in a Libra proposal or in future Libra proposal is uh, actually the launch date. So they moved the launch date not to be in, uh, not to be in June as they announced, but uh, now they're announcing, uh, now they've announced it's gonna be the same for, uh, for the November or uh, 2020 or even throughout uh, 2000, uh, 2021. So that's basically the the that's basically how the, so far uh, Libra was under the scrutiny because they introduced global stablecoin, 
But now I think that this will actually change and the, uh, the many regulatory agencies around the world already have a specific uh, local, uh, uh, local stable coins regulation, which, uh, which actually then uh, uh, Libra will comply. So Libra is, uh, how can I say, is moving towards uh, becoming one of the uh, one of the stable coins and a really fast uh, way for payments, for the global payments. So that would be it for other Thanks. Thank you, Arvin. Uh, thank you for the for the good uh, overview. Uh, and uh, well, let's let's move on to the um, uh, developments in in other baskets, uh, and we'll certainly follow more closely on what's happening with uh, with the further. Uh, when it comes to digital rights, uh, we will skip that at the moment uh, because we'll focus very soon on more on the digital rights, uh, privacy and all these uh, aspects. Um, then uh, we have jurisdiction and legal issues. And there are a couple of things to maybe underline. The, a U.S. judge decided not to reveal surveillance uh, requests from the government. Uh, and the Washington Attorney General sued Facebook over political ads. There was another update where Google must pay for publishing companies and new agencies for reusing content. Uh, basically, uh, Google said it would stop showing new snippets from European publishers on search results for its French in the context of new French law implementing the European Copyright Directive. Now, the French Competition Authority ruled that Google must pay French publishing companies uh, and news agencies uh, for reusing their content. Uh, on infrastructure, the US federal agencies called on the FCC to revoke China Telecom license, uh, sort of a continuation of the tensions uh, on digital policy between, um, between uh, US and China. Uh, and the California Attorney General uh, told ICANN to reject the sale of the .org registry to Ethos Capital. Basically, um, ICANN, uh, I mean, the, the, the Attorney General, State of California, <laughs> ICANN uh, to uh, reject the transfer. Uh, the Attorney General notes that the proposed transfers raise serious concerns that cannot be overlooked, including in relation to transparency and financial matters. And ICANN is expected to make a decision uh, by 4th of May, so we'll see how the... Um, okay, uh, and lastly, uh, the new technologies, the emerging technologies, um, Internet of Things, AI. So there are a couple of interesting updates. Uh, the, the, the World Wide Web Consortium uh, published Web of Things recommendations, recommendations for web integration across Internet of Things. Uh, they, are, they aim to complement existing standards and to enhance in interoperability. Uh, the first guide uh, is the Web of Things architecture, which describes the overall Web of Things conceptual framework. And the second guide is uh, which describes a formal model and common representation. Uh, this is more or less it when it comes to the barometer, uh, but we will... Uh, uh, we will, uh, you can look back at uh, Digital Watch, certainly. And now we'll focus on particular trends in April. And our, I'll start with the first trend, which is tackling misinformation and protecting media freedoms in time of crisis. Yeah. Freedom in time of us. So I'm passing the floor to my colleague Marco to update us more on that. Marco. Thank you. Thank you, Vlada. Uh, the online spread of misinformation uh, related to COVID-19 still has remained a concern for governments, international organizations and uh, internet companies during also the month of April. New measures have been taken to curb the spread of this uh, false information. Before digging and diving into each specific measure, I think it's useful to mention that such measures have also helped to address the spread of confusion that has been spread also during the first weeks of the pandemics, that is the mismatch of, uh, between official information on the one hand and different authority sources on the other. There has been some discrepancies that users have experienced in many countries between the different, uh, let's say, policies and advices that different national governments have experienced and also 
the, the discrepancy between national governments and the information that was spread by international organizations. This said, let's look closer at, uh, at such measures. Many organizations such as the WHO have released their own chatbots to combat the spread of this false information. In particular, the WHO has launched a chatbot on uh, Facebook Messenger. It's not a new measure in the sense that uh, different organizations and the WHO itself had also released other chatbots in the previous weeks on different applications such as WhatsApp. But uh, the availability of the chat box on Facebook Messenger, Messenger is also estimated um, to potentially reach an additional 4.2 billion. The service is, of course, available in uh, different languages, in French, in Spanish, in English, and in Arabic, and is available on the WHO's Facebook page by selecting Send a Message or through the Messenger uh, app link. The app was also developed through a pro bono collaboration with Sprinkler and um, uh, Prunket.org uh, also partnered with the WHO to develop a WHO alert app, which uses the current uh, machine learning technology to tackle the spread of this misinformation. As said, the development of chatbox per se, it's not a new development for the month of April, because the, if this function was already available on different platforms such as WhatsApp. And this is what many governments have been uh, doing, have been developing um, chatbots on WhatsApp. And also more and more governments have been, uh, have been uh, following this trend. In particular, not only local governments such as that of Catalonia, but also national governments such as that of Spain, UK, and, uh, and India have also made these services available in which they uh, on which they also share authoritative information how to combat the virus how to where to find the information where also to access some some supplies in particular in india uh, this service was called my government help desk and as said is available in different in different languages an important uh, pillar of the measures is what has been adopted by by social media companies and internet companies. For example, Facebook has announced that it will start alerting users about COVID-19 misinformation. It's an important development because um, it basically will um, notify users that have interacted with posts that contain harmful coronavirus misinformation about the misleading content. Uh, how will it work? The main point that we have to keep into consideration is that the content that will be flagged is that is uh, it's that uh, that is considered as imminent physical harmful uh, physical harm as causing imminent sorry physical harm by Facebook, and uh, uh, basically it, it could be statements that uh, physical distancing is not effective or uh, false claims about uh, alleged cures of the virus. How will it work? Basically, flag, uh, Facebook will flag the content, it will be taken down. An immediate notification will be sent to users that have interacted with that content. And the same users will be redirected to the authoritative channels of information and pages um, curated by the WHO. So this is in a nutshell what it will work. WhatsApp is also imposed a limit on message forwarding, trying to slow the spread of fake news. The new policy, policy basically prevents users from sharing the same message and forwarding to more than five chats and to more than one chat at a time. Why is WhatsApp using this uh, measure and not adopting this kind of uh, content regulation measures that other platforms have adopted? The uh, reply and the answer relies in the encryption technology that WhatsApp uses, which prevents WhatsApp from looking at the content that users share. So the company has said that they are aware that the content on WhatsApp that is shared could also be uh, positive, uh, so to say, so helpful information, funny videos, but also religious content. But there is no way for WhatsApp, due to the encryption technology, to jump in and filter the content message by message. So basically, by introducing some friction into the forwarding process, they all, the company expects to slow down the rhythm of the spread of uh, viral fake content. As said, also government has stepped forward. For example, they have implemented tougher measures, policy measures to stop the spread of misinformation and punish uh, mainly 
the United Arab Emirates have announced uh, large fines for those who share medical disinformation about COVID-19. Fines that amount up to uh, 5,500 US dollars. In India, the, the citizens have started to be arrested when they post serially and constantly misinformation about coronavirus on social media. And the African government has also, um, the African governments, sorry, have also teamed up with tech giants to address coronavirus related misinformation. One example that is important to cite here is that Nigeria Center for Disease Control is also getting free advertisement space on Facebook for outreach about the pandemic. It's a benefit that is not only, of course, available to African countries, but it, that is, it is proven to be extremely helpful to tackling misinformation in Africa. Twitter has also been uh, tweaking its algorithm to elevate medical information from authoritative sources, an initiative that is also useful to many countries, but especially in, um, in African countries. So as, uh, as we said, misinformation is high on the agenda. One pillar is the, composed by the measures that have been taken by organizations, governments, and social media platforms to curb the spread of misinformation. The second pillar is uh, composed by the raising concerns on, on the impact that such measures have on human rights, but in particular on freedom of expression, privacy, and media freedom. So concerns have been raised regarding the media freedom and the survival, survival sorry, of local media outlets during this crisis time. In particular, an Austri the Austrian-based International Press Institute um, said that African journalists are increasingly being targeted and are harassed while reporting news during COVID-19. They have reported uh, specifically 104 violations worldwide and 22 of these in Africa only. They include verbal and physical attacks, and uh, and they make up most of the most of the violations. In particular, uh, we can cite another example in Serbia, when a journalist has been detained for um, an article related to coronavirus reporting on charges of co causing public unrest and damaging uh, the hospital's reputation after she has reported about a shortage of uh, protective medical equipment that was available for staff. International organizations has, have also warned about uh, the same concern, that is media freedom and the impact of such regulatory measure, measures on media freedoms. In particular, the Council of Europe has published guidance on freedom of expression and information in times of uh, crisis. And I can share in a, in a minute the link in the chat box. And the same Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights warned, warned also governments not to restrict media freedom during COVID-19. I would just close uh, this first trend without uh, without taking uh, much more time by mentioning the last important point that 10 companies have also announced measures to support local journalism. Google and Facebook has launched funds to support local news outlets that are struggling to maintain operations in the face of the coronavirus pandemic. Basically, these organizations would offer grants that they have declared to range from a low thousand of dollars to ten thousand of dollars. Uh, to uh, um, media outlets that are in need of such funds. And at the end of the process, they will announce who has received the funds and how the publisher are spending uh, the money. I would conclude here. If there are any questions, uh, their uh, participants are more than welcome to share them in the chat. And I'll share also some of the links to the resources that I've mentioned. Thank you, Valada. Thank you, Marco, for a, for a very detailed uh, uh, coverage. Uh, it is one of the key topics, the month definitely and beyond the month, certainly, of the COVID crisis. Uh, thank you all for the comments in the chat and discussions and questions. We'll get back to that uh, soon. We'll wrap up with the, with the uh, two remaining trends and what's coming. So I'm uh, from, from Geneva. We are moving to the second, to the US, DC, to Teresa, uh, to tell us more about the uh, data tracing apps, something that's very popular around the world for obvious reasons to control the pandemics, but what are the privacy challenges and what are some of the trends? Um, Teresa, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vlada. And indeed, you know, uh, these developments is something that has certainly uh, made headlines in the in the recent weeks. Uh, what is the issue? Um, more and more countries are implementing or planning to implement contact tracing 
apps that should ha help them uh, in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, COVID uh, it's clear that uh, the current the global health crisis brings some very interesting dilemmas as well as tough choices for governments, for individuals and for society as such. So while many agree that using technology for the tracking uh, of infections, their roots, uh, it's, it's an essential piece of information that we need not only to understand the virus, uh, but also to protect the population and uh, have some efforts in, in controlling uh, the pandemic. On the other hand, uh, and that's what we will focus on in mapping this trend, um, some human rights, uh, privacy, as well as our comfort uh, may really be a challenge, uh, challenged with surveillance of this kind. What we have tried to do uh, at Diplo with the, with the help uh, and diligent work of our data team is that we looked at 195 uh, countries kind of to take stock of the status to see how many of them actually have an app uh, of this kind at place currently. And out of the 195 countries that we had a look at, 48 currently have an app in use and 16 have already announced their plans to do so in a very uh, near future. So uh, obviously some of the questions that many of us uh, uh, and specific communities are asking, uh, it's questions such as what happens if the data uh, gets leaked? What if uh, the data is used for other uh, purposes uh, than just the fight against the virus? Uh, will the surveillance um, uh, stay here forever or is it just a temporary measure? What should the safeguards be? Uh, is it legal actually or what is the legal, uh, legal basis? So in relation to that, uh, you know, clearly uh, the, these uh, contact tracing apps have generated privacy concerns in many countries. Uh, you know, we can name countries such as Australia, Germany, South Africa, the Netherlands and others, you know, where it certainly has made um, uh, headlines. Uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor uh, called for a, a pan-European uh, COVID-19 uh, mobile app, uh, while uh, the European Data Protection Board adopted guidelines on health data uh, and uh, process, how they can be processed, uh, geolocation and other, uh, other tracing tools. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, a, a significant player uh, in this field, uh, has released the uh, best practices uh, on protecting privacy when aggregating location data. Several leading civil society organizations have launched um, uh, or published a joint statement uh, calling for respect to human rights uh, in digital surveillance technologies. And academics around the world have also uh, called for strict privacy-friendly contract tracing apps. It's also interesting to observe how do tech companies uh, address uh, these privacy concerns. Uh, the US um, uh, tech companies are working to develop um, uh, a system using Bluetooth technology uh, that will alert individuals of possible exposure uh, to the virus. Apple and Google, uh, you know, concretely speaking, uh, announced partnership that may solve some of the issues um, that were um, witnessed in, in certain countries on interoperability between iOS and Android um, uh, devices. Um, uh, these con uh, companies, however, got into clash uh, with some governments, especially in Europe. The examples include France and the United Kingdom. So this is just a little teaser of uh, what we plan to follow quite deeply at Diplo next week on the 6th of May uh, with several partners. We will have a webinar that will be really dedicated to this particular issue. And I can already promise that we are trying to take the data analysis of the countries uh, a bit further um, and prepare some kind of a cross comparison of some of the main aspects um, that, um, that can be compared and that might uh, serve as an inspiration to countries uh, that are yet considering these measures. Vlada, that's it for me, and I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you. I think it says that there were already some comments uh, with regards to, uh, to uh, human rights in general. Uh, I will get back to that uh, soon. Uh, in the meantime, Arvin, even though under the, the name of Diplo, already responded to some and will respond to some of the questions about Libra in chat. Moving on to the third trend, um, as obviously we, we see that more and more events are moving online and discussions, uh, we leave it, uh, we, we basically realize the change in the profile, in the format of events, in participation, there is an influx of events. So how, do, how does this move online 
digital policy discussions and diplomacy. And I get back to Geneva now and pass the floor to Jovan. Jovan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vlada. It's uh, great to see you all. We have been running these webinars for a long time online. Now, as you know, many events are shifting online cr and creating quite substantive changes in the way we interact and diplomacy is conducted. One of the major changes is a huge shift of uh, discussions from public spaces like UN, national parliaments, towards proprietary platforms. This is an issue which sooner or later international community will have to address and all countries worldwide. If the key spaces that uh, for our political interaction should be public or uh, if they can, uh, they can be proprietary and private. Now, uh, as you know, at Diplo, we have been following this shift uh, through ConfTech Lab on different level, technological, behavioral, protocol, legal. And uh, we have noticed a few uh, trends in this shift from offline to online meetings. First, there is generally more inclusiveness because there are less uh, obstacles for people to join the meeting. But the question is uh, how much inclusiveness is good for uh, effectiveness of the meetings. And that dynamics between inclusiveness and effectiveness is the major challenge ahead of us. Second point, we are uh, noticing change in the format of the meetings. Traditional physical meetings uh, uh, have evolved towards more round tables, uh, interactive discussions. There is a bit of pushback in uh, online meetings with more talking heads and less interaction, less round table. That is probably the first uh, uh, reaction and that will, uh, be, uh, that will be changing, but we lost on interactivity, generally speaking, in online meetings. I'm, when I'm making this conclusion, I'm referring uh, to Diplo's ongoing monitoring of the way how online meetings are organized. The third point, which is really a lot in the focus of international community is the question of security, privacy, and uh, generally confidentiality of the meetings. As you know, Zoom bombing is all over the place. And there is this first level of security of interaction. I hope that nobody will jump in, in the middle of our uh, Zoom session and show inappropriate materials. But much more deeper questions are question of security of communication, encryption, and I would say even deeper, the question of data. Where are the data stored from the old meetings that we have uh, either in public or closed meetings or, uh, or even private meetings? These changes in the way how diplomacy is conducted are also affecting diplomacy. You probably saw the screens with many heads of states. They now interact via video links. UN procedures and protocol and rituals have to adjust. We have even the first incident during the Security Council meeting when a Russian permanent representative in New York complained that uh, uh, speaker, Minister of Foreign Affairs from Kosovo, uh, should remove uh, the flag, national flag behind him to change his background, uh, which is not according to the UN uh, Security Council rules of procedure. There will, there will be more and more ways and discussions how to adjust traditional uh, rules of procedure to online interaction. At Diplo, we are uh, following this on different levels. We are running also the just-in-time course on online uh, meetings. And we have been noticing another major trend, which is uh, uh, more fatigue after online meetings. Uh, I guess that we can discuss it in more details, but people generally speaking uh, feel more tired after online meetings. One explanation is that we have to put more cognitive power to construct the picture about the other person. In this case, you have to sort of construct perception of me while I'm speaking, which is much easier in physical space. Therefore, we have all sorts of questions from almost philosophical to uh, psychological, diplomatic that we will have to answer uh, for online meeting and in particular for transitions towards blended link meetings, which will emerge after we return to some sort of normality uh, in hopefully a few months. That's all from uh, ConfTech Lab and our reflections on online meetings. Over to you, Vlada. Okay, since Vlada have uh, some 
technical problems with the uh, with the access let us uh, then uh, move on to your questions and comments or marco you can uh, take over the moderation please yes. Yes, exactly. I've been following the discussion online, and there is quite a, there are quite a few few comments and uh, and questions also for the speakers. I will start with the comments regarding the Libra update that are being covered. I saw that he partially answered some of these in the chat, but I think it's good to bring the answers to the attention of the of the whole participants. And uh, some participants are asking, how is the Libra project not going to conflict with those states who are planning to issue a digital fiat currency? Do they expect that states would contract this task out of Facebook, out to Facebook? Another question is, is Libra expected to be transaction, uh, to have transactions cost free, free for its holders and users? So Arvin, I will give you the floor in one minute. I will just read the questions. Um, we have also some questions on the tracing apps. The debate is basically on the balancing between the needs of the tracking due to the pandemic and the transparency concerns, consent and democracy, basically human rights. Some have pointed out that a major problem with uh, tracking apps is that their activity is done without the consent by the users and sometimes also governments. Uh, we foresee a lot of human rights being compromised, which will lead to a retrogression in human rights realizations. Uh, one of the participants is fearing and uh, the other two concerns um, that participants have raised are on transparency. Transparency is becoming much more important and urgent than data minimization. And what is the impact of this lack of transparency for a democracy? These were the two points for Teresa. I will just uh, close with one point on online meetings that addresses to you, uh, Jovan. Uh, think, um, let us think on the effectiveness on online sessions, um, uh, whether it depends on organization. OECD did it well last week, but on a UN call on the other week, the list of participants was, hit, was hidden. So it's very difficult. And Eves is also commenting in the meetings where decisions are made, passing from in-person to online sessions keeps the civil society observers away from the corridors where the decisions are forged. It's the so-called corridor diplomacy. Online provides more formal participation by increasing the numbers in ass the assistance, but decreases sometimes dramatically civil society participatory space and brings us back to, um, to uh, the decision made in small circles without transparency. This is a, a good point. So I summed up the questions first for Arvin, then for Therese, and then for Jovan. I will close uh, just on the questions that were raised regarding the fake news part, since I have the floor. Uh, it was also brought to our attention that in, in Sri Lanka as well, some people were brought under the law for spreading fake news on social media, in addition to the countries that I already mentioned. So thank you for pointing that out. And then we have some interesting comments uh, I think from uh, Richard that there is also an issue with unreliable, unreliable government misinformation regarding COVID. This is, uh, goes back to the consideration that uh, I opened the update with, that uh, some of these measures were aiming at tackling the mismatch of information between different authority sources. Um, it's then up to the users to see to what extent this has been, has been done successfully or not. But he points out also another, a more nuanced um, uh, let's say danger, that the problem is that it's not always obvious what misinformation is. For example, there are legitimate scientific debates regarding the efficacy of ventilators or certain pharmaceuticals. So this, I think, uh, uh, were points that are were, um, worth mentioning. So I'll start giving the floor to Arvin and then Teresa um, on tracing apps and then Jovan on online conferencing. Arvin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I will keep it short since we're already at 40 minutes mark. Uh, regarding the transaction fees, yes, Libra will actually have a transaction fees. Those are small or micro transactions fees, are they called, but they're going to be there. It's, it's not going to be free for use, um, that's for sure. And on another, how it's going to comply with, uh, with national cryptocurrencies or national uh, stable coins basically with this new change with this new proposal uh, proposal libra will not create his own, uh, its own uh, global uh, crypto uh, stable coin but actually will 
<coughs> sorry, will um, connect this stable coin to uh, another uh, another fiat currency or another currency related to certain, certain countries. So basically, this this will allow them to in uh, to introduce uh, future to integrate future. Uh, central banks issue digital currency. It will not make a disruption, but will actually uh, go with the flow with uh, another uh, central bank uh, stable coins. So, if we see a stable coin, uh, central bank stable coin from Europe, they will just change the domination. So, it's going to be it's not going to be Libra towards uh, Euro. It's going to be Libra towards uh, this new uh, this this new crypto. Uh, cryptocurrency that would be in a short of course we will uh, we will expand that more on on our website thanks um, yeah uh, thank you Arvin uh, thank you also for for the questions and comments in the chat you know uh, Rose Prianti Mike Sara I hope I haven't forgotten anybody have, have raised quite an important uh, questions where I would say that the key word has totally been uh, transparency uh, the users of these apps maybe might be expected to cooperate and willing to uh, to share some data if there is clear transparency about why, how, when, and so on and so forth, and where as well, when it goes to questions of where the data is uh, is actually, actually stored. Uh, obviously, some of the comments also um, raise the issue of, um, let's say, um, misuse of government in countries or regimes where there might be, let's say, some grounds for suspicion about uh, how the government will will deal with the assembled uh, data. So that's that's certainly uh, a concern. And by the way, in the mapping uh, that Diplo is doing and that I, uh, that I promise we would cover more in depth next week, this is exactly one of the issues uh, that we are quite interested in, to understand how do governments actually communicate uh, to uh, to their citizens about uh, about their uh, their efforts. One comment that Mike Nelson has mentioned is that uh, you know also related to transparency that transparency is actually more important here than data minimization. Yeah. So if we if we or governments can communicate uh, this very very transparently, uh, there might be uh, it might be expected that citizens will cooperate. I'll stop here. Over to Jovan. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, just a few few uh, comments. Uh, one is that uh, Eves, you mentioned the civil society is losing because of the lack of corridors diplomacy, but there are no corridors these days, and uh, we have to see uh, where are they happening. Do we lose the transparency, inclusiveness with this shift from offline to online? Generally speaking. After the adrenaline phase, where we rush to Zoom to different platforms just to continue our work, we are now reflecting, I think, more seriously about the nature of this transition. And some insights are counterintuitive. If we are honest with ourselves, even when we sit in uh, in situ meetings, we very often browse on our computer and we are somewhere away from the from the discussion itself, cognitively, not physically. Therefore, there are uh, needs for much deeper uh, reflections on the effectiveness, waste of time uh, or use of time, and generally usefulness on uh, online learning. This transition online on the offline will result in the blended approach and more serious discussion on all types of human interaction, including meetings, teaching, interacting, and other areas. Therefore, the whole discussion has to raise on higher level than simple notion that offline is better than online, which we more or less know because of the emotional context. Uh, at Diplo, we are starting discussion in Geneva on future meetings, and the ConfTech Club is following in details all of these articles, trends, and discussion that are emerging into some sort of new uh, study uh, discipline, which we can call it mythology or the meetingology, whatever you call it. Therefore, that's the, just a quick uh, reflection. More will follow soon on different events and via our website. Or Thank you, Jovan. Uh, well, I guess my connection is back. I hope so. Uh, you can hear me and you can see me well. Um, thanks for that. And we are moving then to uh, uh, the what's coming in, in May, basically, out of the events. Uh, 
again, a number of number of events are either cancelled or, or uh, moved to online in a way. Uh, we have the conference on blockchain and cryptocurrency moved online. Uh, the fifth UN multi-stakeholder forum on science, technology, innovation for SDGs postponed. Right, the ripe uh, AT meeting moved online, which is, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, uh, we have the GFC five series of online meetings, which is continuing throughout uh, throughout May. Uh, and uh, briefly to move uh, into what we're going to cover uh, in Diplo in uh, in the next uh, well days, uh, uh, what's happening in Diplo and the GIP in, in May, and in the next days, we continue without uh, with online debates on uh, uh, digital uh, digital aspects. So we have the rights on debate uh, on uh, COVID-19 and women. Uh, uh, the Digital Watch newsletter next week, which is coming out, so stay tuned. It's a great reading for a coffee, morning coffee or evening. Um, number of other webinars on contracting, tracing ups and challenges to privacy. What Teresa mentioned, that, that would be also one very interesting uh, debate. And then Road to Burn via Geneva, sharing of data towards the Data Commons on 26th of May. And certainly, again, the last... Uh, Tuesday of uh, of the month, 26th of May, the next internet government where we look back uh, into May and look forward into um, June. Uh, now moving on to the regional updates, as always, this is a great uh, value added to our webinars is the regional coverages, local hubs and regional perspectives. So I'm passing the floor to my colleague Andriana to lead us through the regional updates. Andriana. Thank you for the floor, Vlada, and thank you to the colleagues for the roundup of developments in April. Also to the audience, thank you for being active and for your questions and comments. We now have the regional updates. First up, we have Amrita Chaudhry with updates from Asia, specifically on Australia's decision that digital platforms pay media outlets for reusing content, and on Facebook acquiring 9.9 .9 stake in Reliance Geo. Over to Amrita. Welcome to the regional update from Asia for the month of April. I will highlight two developments this time. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission announced that online platforms such as Google and Facebook would have to pay fair compensation to news media for their content. This decision to mandate compensation for news articles displayed in online platforms comes at a time when the coronavirus pandemic has badly affected the advertising revenue of media houses. The Australian government had earlier attempted to negotiate a voluntary code, however the discussions failed. News content has been a lucrative revenue stream for online platforms and governments across the world have been struggling with this issue. Whether Australian government would succeed in this attempt will depend on the details of how the digital platforms will be required to pay media outlets. In India, Facebook has bought 9.9% stake in Reliance Geo, part of Reliance Group of Companies, for 5.7 billion US dollars. This deal will allow Facebook to strengthen their foothold in India's fast-growing consumer market and Reliance to reduce their debt burden. Apart from this investment, Geo platforms, Reliance Retail and Facebook's WhatsApp services have entered into a commercial agreement whereby WhatsApp would be used to further accelerate Geo's e-commerce business and is believed to help in the launch of WhatsApp Pay in India. This deal will, however, have to be cleared by India's antitrust watchdog, the Competition Commission of India, who will assess if the partnership will adversely impact the telecom and retail market. The massive data that the two companies will jointly hold, both trade as well as consumer, could be something that regulators would want to evaluate. That is all for this month. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. Next, we have Jacob Adame Biden, who will highlight the developments from Africa. These include e-commerce platform Jumia implementing contactless delivery and cashless payments to help address the spread of COVID-19. Then Facebook launching coronavirus information centers across the African continent and Alphabet's Loon deploying internet connectivity balloons to Kenya. Jacob, over to you. Hello, this is Jacob Odami Baden, and I bring you the African Regional Digital Policy Development Update for the month of April 2020. 
For our first update, African e-commerce platform Jumia has announced that it is implementing a contactless delivery of prepaid packages on its platform to boost efforts to ensure the safety of their customers, agents, and partners in the wake of the outbreak of COVID-19. According to a report, Jumia customers can make prepaid payments for products through the Jumia Pay Payment Solution and get their products delivered without body contact or exchange of cash with delivery agents. For our second update, Facebook has expanded its coronavirus information centers originally launched in South Africa to several other countries in Africa. According to a news report, the information centers form part of several mechanisms Facebook is putting in place to support the global fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Facebook built the centers in, on its platform in collaboration with national health partners across over 17 countries in sub-Saharan Africa to ensure that people can get access to accurate, reliable, and timely information from trusted health sources. Then for our last update, according to a news report, Loon, the Alphabet-owned high-altitude broadband connectivity company aiming to bring high-speed internet to underserved, high-to-rich places, has launched the first balloons that will make its services commercially available to Kenyans. Following the approval by the Kenyan government to deploy the services, Loon has partnered with Telcom Kenya to run tests after which the service will be rolled out to subscribers of Telcom Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. We now have Noha Fati with updates from the Middle East and North Africa. Noha will tell us how the e-commerce sector in the Middle East is faring post-COVID-19 outbreak and about global civil society urging the Gulf countries to unblock VoIP services. Over to Noha. Hello, I hope you are all healthy and safe. Uh, this is Noha Fatli. Uh, I cover internet governance developments in the Middle East and North Africa region. The first update in April is regarding a, a report published by Arab Clicks that highlights that the e-commerce sector is thriving post the outbreak of COVID-19 in the Middle East. Because of the local lockdown of many businesses, the growth opportunities of the e-commerce sector in the Middle East was improved since many individuals and companies are currently buying online because of the lack of options or the absence of other options. The rise in electronic shopping during the past two months could also be attributed to the fact that these services help reduce time and effort as well as crowds in shopping centers. During the first few months of 2020, continuous growth was reported in the United Arab Emirates e-commerce market, exceeding 5% of sales. It's expected that the retail sector in the Gulf will jump to around uh, $308 billion by 2023 compared to $253 billion um, dollars achieved in 2018. Uh, the second update is regarding uh, a joint a statement uh, that was signed by 29 organizations to call uh, upon Gulf governments to permanently lift the ban on all uh, voice over IP platforms used for voice and uh, video internet calls. The ban uh, void services which have been blocked since 2017 have an adverse impact on fundamental rights of freedom of expression, uh, privacy and access to information. Amid uh, the COVID-19 crisis, some Gulf countries have already relaxed restrictions on some of the VoIP apps and platforms. For example, the United Arab Emirates and Oman governments have unblocked on an exceptional and temporary basis apps that allow for distance um, learning such as Microsoft Teams, Skype for Businesses, Google Hangouts and Zoom. Qatar has further allowed Microsoft Teams and Zoom services. Thank you. Thanks, Noha. At the end, we will hear from Andre Edwards with updates from the Caribbean region. Andre will update us on COVID-19 virtual screenings via mobile phones in Cuba and telecommunications operators offering education rates in British Virgin Islands. Andre, please go ahead. Andre Edwards with Caribbean updates. COVID-19 virtual screenings via mobile phones in Cuba. The University of Computer Sciences, UCI, along with the Ministries of Communications and Public Health, have developed a mobile application, Pesquisador Virtual, that allows every citizen with mobile data to report on their health. This initiative is expected to support the wider screening activities that are being conducted across the island. 
This is as a result of the new coronavirus and is expected to help authorities to detect persons with symptoms faster as there is real-time analysis of the data that's entered by medical professionals within each region. Mobile app can be accessed either through the Ministry of Health network or the Cuban app store AppClis. The user registration process will capture enough personal information so that the health professionals can contact them if needed, and then they will be asked to fill out a simple survey that tracks symptoms, contact with infected persons, or recent travel history. This can be repeated for others within the household. Telecom service providers offer education rates in UVI. The British Virgin Islands telecom providers are supporting the educational sector by offering specially discounted internet packages to students to facilitate online learning. The Education Minister, Dr. Natalia Wheatley, announced this following talks with the service providers. One of the telecoms is also providing laptops to different educational institutions as well. Two of the telecom providers will also zero rate access to specific websites that provide educational content for local consumption. The ministry is continuing discussions on other ways that telecom operators can provide support. Other organizations have also donated laptops to students without access to devices, and the private sector is being encouraged to support the ministry's adopt a school program so that more students can be afforded a hassle-free entry to learning through digital channels. Thank you, Andre. Uh, let me thank once again uh, all of uh, the curators, Amrita, Jacob, Noha, and Andre, for sharing the updates from their regions. That brings us to the end of our April briefing. Uh, all the updates that we described can be found on Digital Watch, and the regional updates can be found on the link that I will share with you in the chat right now. At this point, I would like to give the floor back to Vlada for the final wrap up. Vlada, over to you. Thank you, Andreana. It's such a big team, it's not easy to catch up and thank you for, for all the, the, the coverage. Uh, we came to the end of the webinar just in time, I would say, two o'clock. Uh, and a reminder that uh, all of the details you can find on the Digital Watch website and you can expect the uh, monthly newsletter from Digital Watch covering most of that and much more uh, in, in uh, the next days during next week. Uh, we'll stay tuned uh, and if not earlier, at the other webinars we organize. Uh, see you uh, next last Tuesday of the month, which is the last Tuesday of May for the next IG briefing. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.